Welcome to Northwest Brew Talk. I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. And this is episode number 16. On today's show, we're going to have an interview with Brickyard Brewing of Woodenville, our brew news and views, and local music from the Hoot Hoots. If you have any comments or questions, send us an email to nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at nwbrewtalk and on Facebook at facebook.com slash nwbrewtalk. To start the show, let's open a beer. Okay, this is Damnesia India Parallel from Amnesia Brewing. This beer has 6.2% ABV and it's in the can. Amnesia Brewing opened in 2004 in North Portland and over the years found that the space they were in was not big enough for them to expand how they wanted, so they moved to Washgool, Washington. They are 21 and over and open seven days a week. They offer food and, of course, great beer. And this beer is kind of coppery color, a little darker. They have a nice description of their Damnesia IPA on their website. Hoppy Northwest IPA. The color is golden orange. Clarity is slight haze. Body, medium to full. Aroma, big citrus, ripe peaches, and melon. Yum. Flavor, citrus and herbal flavors with a smooth caramel depth. Bitterness, moderate. A bold Northwest Hoppy IPA with big fruity flavors and aroma up front while tailing off with a pleasant caramel herbiness. I think I'm missing some of those flavors. Uh, I'm not sure if the beer is old, but uh, oh. yeah, I'm missing a few of those flavors. Anyhow, not going to uh, degrade them because of that. But uh, yeah, we could definitely have to try out another one of their uh, or another one of their beers. And now on to our brew news and views. <laughs> Business Insider reported last week that Evan Parent, a California craft beer drinker, has filed a class action lawsuit against Miller Coors, claiming that because it's priced like a priced like and portrayed as a craft beer, he was deceived into believing it was. His lawsuit states that since Miller Coors exceeds the six million barrel limit, it is not independent and does not include only traditional traditional craft ingredients, Blue Moon is not a craft beer and should not be marketed as such. One of his points is that nowhere on the label do you see Miller Coors names. One lawyer doesn't believe Evan Parent is necessarily out for blood, but he may be named plaintiff for the lawyers suing in the case at class action, hoping for a big payday. The article questions whether Blue Moon should be able to be mass-produced and sold as craft beer, which real craft breweries work hard at building. Or should Blue Moon have to be sold next to its cheap siblings, Miller and Coors Light? We shall see in the coming months how this plays out. All right. Washington Beer Blog reported that Flyers Brewery and Rest- uh, Fryer's Restaurant and Brewery is opening a new location in Skagit County. Flyers Restaurant and Brew House will be opening at the Skagit Valley Regional Airport. At this time, it will be just a restaurant, but owner Tony Savoy says there is plenty of room and there is always a possibility for a new brewery. Tony is also working with Alan Rose from Anacortes Brewing and Brian Kruger from Boundary Bay Brewery to develop a new brewing program for Skagit Valley College. It's still early, so all the details have not yet been worked out. Spokane Craft Beer Week is in full swing swing as we speak. Started on Monday the 11th and goes until the 17th. Over 20 breweries are participating in over 30 events. This is the first annual, and there will be seven beer collaborations, including an oyster stout. There are food, truck, beer pairings, music, beer, of course, and more. So check out SpokaneCraftBeerWeek.com for all the events and locations. And the 7th Annual Seattle Beer Week started May 7th and goes through the 17th. There are events across the area every single day celebrating beer and all that is Seattle. So make sure to check out SeattleBeerWeek.com for full event listings. American Brewing Company at Edmonds recently acquired the Buka Live Kombuka brand for $800,000 in stock and cash. Kombuka is a sparkling fruit tea. American is trading at $5 million market value, only one, uh, 
one of only five craft breweries on the stock market. Currently, the stock is trading around 50 cents a share. Narrows Brewing in, in Tacoma is gearing up for the U.S. Open, which will take place at Chambers Bay June 15th through 21st, just three miles away. U.S. Open caters... Caterers chose Narrow's Giant Pacific Octopus to be IPA for the open and added Galloping Gertie Goldie, Golden Ale in the hospitality tents that chose to include premier beverages. Narrow's Brewing will be celebrating their second anniversary in July. Galloping Gertie Golden. Yeah, that was tough to say. It was. And lastly this week, Flying Bike Cooperative Brewery in Seattle announced the hiring of their very first employee, head brewer Kevin Forham. His most recent position was regional brewer for Ram Restaurant and Brewery Chain. He previously worked at Pike Brewing, then Big Time Brewery, then Elysian Fields for Elysian Brewing, and there was a little stop in Spain for a couple of years. Flying Bike is a co-op with 1,091 members and a seven-barrel system set to open in June. Kevin said about Flying Bike, quote, I'm honored, excited, a little nervous, and very hopeful that the Flying Bike has a future as unique and promising as its beginnings, unquote. Flying Bike just received their brewing system last week, and their initial five recipes they acquired through member-driven homebrew competitions. Their uh, Storm Cycle CDA is on tap at Counter Balance Brewing. Okay. I wanted to talk for a minute about oh, that yeah. first uh, story that we did about oh, the yeah. Miller Coors how do you feel about that? Do you think that they should have to say Miller Coors on the label when they're those giant brands that disguise themselves as craft brews? Well, you know, uh, it's it's a tough thing because um, you know every one of these craft breweries they have their name on the brew on the can on the bottle whatever it is. Uh, honestly, um, when I first drank Blue Moon years ago, I had no idea that they were you know owned by a giant company. Right. So. Should they? Uh, I mean, it's not a secret. You know, I've read some stuff, and they've they've never hidden the fact that, that they own the company. Right. It takes two seconds to go Google it and figure it out. Right. But if you're in a restaurant or a bar and you see Blue Moon and, you know, Amnesia and Lazy Boy next to each other, you know, if you know Blue Moon because they're a bigger name, you know, you might grab that because you think that it's a craft beer. So to answer your question... Do I think that they should have their name? I, I, I'm I not positive that they should, but I think that there should be a little more disclosure, a little more openness about, uh, a little more honesty about it. You know, I think about when we go into, you know, a grocery store mm-hmm. to go buy a beer, and we've looked at several brands, and I mean, now we always buy something from Washington, so it always says something on the label right. about being a local brewery, but... Uh, I know that there's a couple times that we've bought stuff and, and said, you know, I'm not quite sure right. where it's coming from. Mm-hmm. So it would be nice to. And even sometimes the smaller brands that are acquired by the big guys, you know, you're not you're not never 100 percent certain. No, I know. There's there's a few of those that are um, owned entirely by uh, Mega Beer. And right. it doesn't say anywhere on their labels that that they are, you know, and there's a few of them that. um you know, they own a percentage. You know, does it mean that Red Hook is bad because Bud owns a chunk of them but not controlling interest, you know? But it's one of those things. If you want to know where your money is going, then you want to support the strictly local businesses. That well, at the same time, Red Hook has a big brewery in Woodenville, so you are supporting local people. Absolutely. You're right. Yeah. So definitely, if, uh, you know, comes down to things like that, it's definitely something that... Uh, uh, you might want to check out before you grab another beer. <laughs> and that is now our Brew News and Views for this week. Welcome back to Northwest Brew Talk. If you have not yet subscribed to our podcast, why not do it now? It's free, available on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and other sites. And if you like us, a review and rating would be really appreciated. But even more important, tell your friends about NW Brew Talk via social media or whatever way you want. That uh, definitely will help us. And now we're going to talk to Ian and Joe from Brickyard Brew in Woodenville. You guys are Mm -hmm. co-owners? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So how did it come about? How did uh, Brickyard start out? Well, <clears throat> as co-owners, we're uh, we're neighbors actually. Okay. We're like two two houses away in the in the cul-de-sac, um, 
had, I, once upon a time, I actually worked for Joe. He had another business uh, in this facility. We decided to convert it into a brewery. Just maybe that business was, yeah. was doing okay, but we found brewing would be a little bit better. <laughs> I'd sold actually a portion of it and uh, they ended up leaving 50% of the facility empty and we're kind of brainstorming, what do we do with that? And decided the, the brewery, we'd, we'd actually been living next door to each other for six years or something, brewing at our own houses, but never really knew each other. And you know, after he'd uh, came and worked at, at one of the businesses for a while, we started talking about home brewing and our passion for it. And that came to the idea of actually starting, starting the brewery over time. Um, originally it was going to go into uh, a, a bar over the Horseshoe Saloon, um, which is uh, right by Brickyard Road. And when that uh, didn't work out, we came up with the name Brickyard Brewing because that was yeah. you know, the road we lived by and everything. We lived off of Brickyard Road. Okay. Yeah. So Makes that, sense. That name yeah. ended up sticking. <laughs> so it's not like Brickyard 500. A lot of people ask us, is oh. it based on Brickyard 500, the race cars <laughs> and things like that? And uh, no, it's actually Brickyard Road, which is the original road between the east side of uh, Seattle and, and the Seattle metropolitan area. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, so when did you open? Was it two thousand? Was it two thousand twelve now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, what year, what Officially, been open for? it was October twelfth, two thousand twelve. Right. We had opened three or four months before that, so okay. soft opening. Sure. Yeah. So we were at that Father's Day beer fest to that, that oh, two thousand twelve, okay. and kind of were open afterwards. We we're out of beer right after the event, but <laughs> <laughs> we were we were here. <laughs> okay. It was a challenge yeah. because we'd started with just this one barrel brew house and. We were, you know, brewing three batches into the three-barrel fermenters, a 14-hour brew day, and still couldn't keep enough just to supply the tap room and the um, and the festivals and all that. So it was it was challenging at first. <laughs> challenging in a good way, though. I mean, mm -hmm. you're yeah. selling out of your mm -hmm. beer, so that's that was a good. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Right, right. We ended but up a little challenging hours-wise. I mean, yeah, he yeah. has his other business, you know, or businesses, right. and then, uh, I was still working full time. Yeah. So trying to include oh, yeah. a 12 hour brew day and then 12 or 15 hours of cleaning mm -hmm. for three or four beers yeah. while working. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of work. And then yeah. to watch yeah. those beers get gobbled up in a matter of a week, it's yeah. like, oh wow, okay, we've got to do it all over again. All over again, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I could see it. that one and that be a little straining on you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, with kids too. Oh, you know, yeah. He has two, I have one, so. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I get that. <laughs> um, so what size system do you have now, you guys? What we ended up doing is partnering with another local brewery, mm -hmm. um, buying in a percentage of the ownership share, and then creating what's called an alternating proprietorship, where uh, you know Brickyard has its own two 30-barrel fermenters. We have uh, you know share the brew house. We, sh we lease time on the brew house, so to say, and then we brew in 15-barrel batches. So we're producing generally 30 barrels uh, per fermentation of, of the beer. Okay. Which equates to you know 30, uh, 60 kegs or so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So how many, uh, okay, a couple of years into this now, so how many uh, barrels did you brew last year? Uh, based on the reporting, the numbers were, boy, that's, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm going to say it was about, it was less than 1,000. It was about 800 barrels. Okay. We were just kind of ramping up at that point. Is that right, 800 barrels? Sounds about right. I'm going to. I'm gonna think because he he counts the numbers. Joe counts the numbers in the end and submits all that stuff. By me, I'm, I'm just brewing, and then at the end of the year, I have to count back how many batches I did. <laughs> okay. So if you say so, sure. It's approximately <laughs> approximately 800. Sounds <laughs> fine to me. Right. So do you both brew? Ian does 90. He's, percent He's the head brewer. He okay. does the vast majority of the brewing. Uh, he makes all the good stuff. I make oh. the stuff that uh, you know <laughs> that you want. Yeah. That Sorry. <laughs> Joe does 10 percent of the brewing here. <laughs> yeah, that's a question. Ten or less. <laughs> Ten or less. <laughs> that's quite cool. Sorry. Yeah. This is Max, our bar, our, yeah. our head bartender, and now actually going to be assistant brewer. So. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. And that's all done at the other facility, then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Ian does all the brewing at the yeah. other facility. I do a yep. batch here or there on the soil system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so those are just specialty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, a lot of bottles. Do they? They have a bottling line too. Uh, no, we use the the mobile bottling oh, okay. service. Oh, is, it Mi is it Micro Beer Source? I think Micro Beer name? Source, Ron okay. Gregerson. Yeah, yeah they yeah. just go around and bottle for you. Yeah, it's amazing. They show up, hook up to the tank, and poof. Yeah, yeah. a couple hours later, I've got yeah. cases. That's four cool. pallets of uh, beer. Four yeah. pallets of beer. Very cool. Yeah. 
So, what was the first beer that you brewed as Brickyard? The Brickyard IPA was that the first one? I think so. Yeah, the Brickyard IPA, and then it shortly or shortly followed or tied with the oatmeal stout, mm -hmm. the masonry oatmeal stout. Yeah. So, how long have you guys both been, uh, or were you home brewers before that? Um, I don't know. If I haven't asked what year for you. I, my first batch of homebrew was the mid '90s, '95, '96, somewhere in there. I brewed off and on over the uh, the years. You know, I moved and lived in a lot of different states and Japan for a while. I did brew over there, and so here or there. But since '95, '96, earlier than I did, I brewed with my father-in-law probably seven years prior to opening the brewery. Okay. On a little, you know, half barrel, ten, mm -hmm. ten gallon sort of system, mm -hmm. yeah. and you both just loved it. Yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, is it still fun? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of hours, but yes, it's still fun. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, it's fun. It's uh, interacting with people, making the beer, talking to them about it, and you know, interacting at brew festivals, getting feedback, and right. uh, trying to come up with new concepts is, is always challenging and entertaining for sure. Right now, do you yeah. do you go to a lot of the festivals? Yeah. yeah. How many last year? Uh, we were at 25 to 26, 25, 26 festivals yeah. last year, anywhere from the local, mm -hmm. you know, donation event mm -hmm. to, you know, something major. Right. Yeah. And we're, we're still limited workforce. I mean, there's a couple of, you know, Max and a couple of other people work the tap room, but it's pretty much just Ian and I doing the beer fest mm -hmm. and doing, you know, all the sales and production. We do work with a distributor, obviously, for, for selling the distribution beers, but uh, pretty much just Ian and I as far as the yeah. business side of the business is concerned. So, um, I know you were going, uh, Ian, you were talking about the beers earlier. So, how many mm -hmm. how many regular beers do you have on tap normally? Is it four or five? I mean, the, the, of the core product, I'd mm -hmm. say we have the, uh, would be now the Concrete Blonde, mm -hmm. uh, the Green Chili Blonde, the Southwest Hatch Green Chili Blonde, the Trail Marker IPA, and the Masonry Oatmeal Stout. Mm -hmm. I think are our core product, the ones mm -hmm. that we'd put into a bottle. Mm -hmm. um, we do have others that we, we we produce here, but that's the name. A lot of one-off beers. Uh, you know, we'll do some uh, you know oak aging, some bourbon oaks, and yeah. fun uh, additions. One-off beers. We'll get like uh, um, pre-release hops occasionally, and do stuff with that. Mm -hmm. And more, you know, different yeah, experimental experimental hops. Yeah, there yeah. You know, yeah. smaller yeah. stuff might be uh, pumpkin ales, of course. You mm -hmm. know, seasonal that pumpkin um, peach ale, of course. Yeah. <laughs> pumpkin peach ale. Pumpkin peach ale, right, yeah. The, the pumpkin ale, or we've done the winter ale here in the small system, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of saisons. We had an ESB for a while. Um, Some uh, infused beers. We did a IPA with coffee in it. Uh, we did that hatch green chili, which has chili peppers and peaches, and uh, what's other infused stuff? A couple others like that. It's tough to keep track of them. Right. Yeah, you know, we have the four, four or five that we do over there, and then mm -hmm. producing stuff over here after a do, year and a half. Do you know how many oh. different beers you've you've actually produced? I think on Untapped, if you if you base it on Untapped, the ones people are reviewed, I want to say it's 15, 12 to fifteen. Twelve to fifteen. Unique beers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. But then a few others that never made it there. So <laughs> there's right. a small batch that right. never got reviewed. Yeah. Never got Does that reviewed. sound right? That sounds about right. Yeah. There's probably more on the on Untapped because people don't see the name. They'll put another name oh, in, or yeah. you know, don't know it's called something else. Now, are there anything that uh, any styles that you haven't tried yet that you'd want to, or any types? So yeah, Brickyard hasn't produced um, a Belgian ale yet, so um, that's certainly something that I mm -hmm. I want to want to work with. Mm -hmm. We haven't done. I'm not so big about Hefeweizens. We haven't mm -hmm. done wheat, wheat beers, wheat-based beers, mm -hmm. but we do do Saison, which is somehow, sim it's similar, but mm -hmm. not the same. Right. Ian started a sour program. He's okay. got six different types of, uh, you know, bacteria going on with the same type of beer, same yeast, and it's, uh, I think it's what we're tell maybe talking yeah. about that one. Yeah, just we, we're talking about having a sour beer. We have, Max is always bugging me about a sour. We've got another regular who's always talking about sour. So I said, okay, fine, I've got a lot of carboys mm -hmm. from the homebrewing days. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I did is I just do, I did a single barrel of a Flanders Red, split it up, split it up amongst the uh, amongst the carboys, shows I think it's a Belgian Abbey yeast, mm -hmm. and then inoculated each of the carboys with a different sour strain, which okay. will be lactobacillus or the uh, 
the uh, you know Brettanomyces or uh, I think a Lambicis, something mm -hmm. like that. Okay, and this is basically yeah. a precursor towards you know we figure out which one we like the best, mm -hmm. and it'll be a precursor yeah. towards doing the larger batch, which will yeah. okay. run out of the bigger actual? system and put it into real barrels. Mm -hmm. The goal is just to figure out okay, so what do the yeasts produce? What do they end up tasting like? Because I mm -hmm. commercially will buy a sour beer, but what's in it? You mm -hmm. know, so they say that's on the label, but what does it actually taste like mm -hmm. later on? Cool. So you've got what six, six or so different ones? Yeah, there's six of them back yeah. there. And that'll just be like a tap room release when we, right. when we get them ready, and then ultimately it'll be it'll be nine months or so before we actually release mm -hmm. a you know distribution level um, sour product. So uh, we're eagerly anticipating it, but it's still yeah. a ways out. <laughs> right. That's another direction that we're we're going to work in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So um, how many of the beers do you bottle? Just the four. We the have four the uh, masonry yeah. oatmeal stout, the trail marker IPA, the um, hatch green chili blonde, and the brickyard IPA. With the uh, concrete blonde actually releasing in the next couple of months, the distributor has been pushing us to get that out on bottle. We're working on label development right now. Okay. And and where do you distribute to? I mean, how far off do you guys go? All uh, Washington and into Idaho. Are you? Okay. We're working towards Montana right now. I'm, just now communicating with some distributors in Montana, and hopefully within the next six months we'll be in Montana as well. That's just bottle you do, do that, or keg too? Draft and bottle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. We've just bought another 300, almost 300 kegs, so mm. we're set pretty well for kegs for the time being. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And do you guys enter any competitions? Have you entered any beers? Well, we have just now started to do that. We're doing the Washington Beer, Beer Awards. Mm -hmm. Competition, I think that's actually the first. No, we, we entered the beer last year for the Sip, Sip Magazine uh, Best of the Northwest, mm -hmm. and the Stout got third place in that. In that, but that would have been, I think, the first real competition that we mm -hmm. had entered into. And the Washington Beer Awards, I think we're entering. We just signed up to enter four beers this year in the Washington Beer Awards. Okay, great. Yeah. Crossing so, our fingers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Now. Um, what do you think uh, makes your beer stand out from everybody else? I think that the the IPA stands out. I mean, you know, it's a different style than what you would normally get out of a Washington IPA. You know, the Washington IPAs typically are like big and hopped. Mm -hmm. Everybody, this like crowd that likes to just get a lot of bitter in the face, and that. But I also got a lot of. I've heard a lot of feedback that people say, "Yeah, but I just." That's great. You can have 100, 200, 500 IBUs, but is it enjoyable or not? Mm -hmm. So ours is intended to be more enjoyable and a little bit less bitter, but still just a great IPA. Mm -hmm. Lower IBUs, but more aroma. So right. we're packing it full of uh, aromatic hops and keeping the IBUs a little bit lower, right in that 50 to 60 okay. IBU range, lighter bodied and um, you know more in that drinkable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Not, not uh, burn the enamel off your teeth. Sort of. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you can have a couple of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that we don't do that with certain <coughs> seasonal beers too, just because right. you know people do like that. But sure. our regular full time IPA is mm -hmm. now more of that aromatic style. Yeah. Look at that. The uh, the chili beer. Mm -hmm. Just we wanted a beer you could actually yeah. drink. Mm -hmm. it's just every chili beer you run across, I have problems selling my beer because of the other chili uh -oh. beers. I'll say it's their mm -hmm. fault. Um, <laughs> but <coughs> they're just intended to burn you up. Yeah. You know, or let's see how much of a man you are or a woman you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you drink it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the way Ian did it is, is brilliant. He actually took the, uh, you know, the hatch green chilies, but he used peaches to help tie together that chili aroma and the um, and, and the beer flavor, and it really balances it out nicely and makes it easier to drink than I, th I think it would be otherwise. Um, and the st story behind that's kind of funny, actually. We do a focus group periodically where we bring people in, and I like to think of Ian as a little bit of a mad scientist. He, he takes bottles, uh, I think we had 12, 12 different bottles or oh, something like that last time we did, and he puts different spices, he puts mm. different you know flavorings in it and that sort yes. of stuff, and we kind of pass it around and get feedback from the, from the table, um, and, uh, and that Hatch Green Chili Blonde was the first one that went around the entire table and everybody was thumbs up, you gotta, mm. you gotta do this. You know, other ones some people liked, you know, like the lime or they like the lemon or different spices, but this was the only one that every single person around this table said you gotta do this. Yeah, mm -hmm. everybody agreed on it, yeah. So it probably shouldn't say chili in it if you wanna <laughs> get people to try it then, right? Yeah, right, right, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think the hatch green chili mm -hmm. makes a little bit of a difference because right. it's more of a upicarian, more of a chef's choice mm -hmm. sort of chili that, that brings up the desirability. Nice. 
Um, so you've already partnered uh, into the other brewery, so that gives you um, the ability to brew quite a bit now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is goal, I mean, obviously expanding to Montana. Uh, what else do you have on future goals? I mean... We haven't really told anybody yet, but we just purchased a 10-barrel brew house oh. from a local brewery that we will be implementing over the next 12 months. Nice. So we'll be moving away from that partnership with the other local brewery and then having our own, bringing our, bringing our fermenters over here, bringing the other equipment over here, and doing all the brewing on-site at Brickyard. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can do everything right here, then? Do everything right here, yeah. yeah. It's a pain having to move equipment back and forth all the sure. time. I gotta fill kegs here and fill oh. kegs there and use yeah. hoses on this system and that system. Not to mention yeah. the record uh -huh. keeping. You know, oh. yeah. Yeah. Your, yeah. your record keeping duplicates also, and that makes it a lot more worse. Yeah. Sure. A lot more difficult, rather. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Sounds great. So, what uh, has there been any major obstacle or or problem that you've come across? From a sales standpoint, I'll tell you the uh, the market just continues to get more and more competitive out there. You know, there's new production breweries opening up on a weekly basis. It seems like these days. So as the uh, you know the shelf space isn't really increasing that much at the grocery stores, but there's more and more breweries going for that shelf space. So that's probably been the biggest obstacle because we're a little bit off the beaten tap room is a little bit off the beaten track you know mm -hmm. we don't have as much foot traffic coming in the door so our goal is to sell the majority of our beer through distribution and um, growing that has been a little bit more challenging I think than we first expected mm. yeah I think that's probably the, the major challenge is just getting to know bars and having them be aware of who we are and having mm -hmm. relationships with them and you know we're Getting them, getting our beer in there at least once every couple of months. Right, right. <laughs> we don't have any full-time sales staff, so right. it's, again, it's pretty much us trying to help work with the distributor and get the uh, get new placements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So many bars have the rotating tap handles. Well, you know, you and hundred other uh, hundred other breweries, mm -hmm. you can rotate it every once in a while. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> now, do you see? I mean, obviously, like you said, there's new breweries opening all the time. Do you see a saturation point? I believe in distribution beer, we're starting to hit uh, a theoretical saturation point, you know, if, um, because again, that shelf space is not increasing that much more than, than, um, than it has in the past. You know, more places are starting to sell craft beer. I think there's more opportunity in the uh, brew pub environment. I just wrote a little email to Ian today about this. Yeah. There's more opportunity in a brew, brew pub sort of environment, mm -hmm. local, you know, retail sales. Um, and that's, um, I think that's where... I'd like to see us have a little bit more growth over the next couple of years is, is get more retail sales, possibly open a brew pub environment. You know, we're okay. not going to have any specific plans to do that at this time, but uh, it's one of those things we envision happening somewhere down the line. Okay. Yeah. So you'd keep this then still? So then you still have two locations? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're still then, yeah, we have the... This, this is like a little clubhouse, you know, right. it's, it's off the beaten path. I mean, I know on the podcast you can't see pictures of it or anything like that, but... Um, you know, we have a great local following here. We don't get too much out of the local area besides beer travelers or whatever. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely, uh, it does well. It takes care of itself, so mm -hmm. to say. And, and it's, it's a fun little place to hang out. So we will keep this. Yeah. Makes sense. All righty. Thanks to Ian and Joe from Brickyard Brewery for joining us today. Now, we'll be right back after a local music break from the Hoot Hoots. the day. 
You can check them out at thehoothoots.bandcamp.com. Okay, we'd like to take a moment to recommend a local restaurant slash bar to our listeners. NYP recently opened up in uh, Burlington, and uh, they've got several locations in, from uh, Bellingham all the way down to Seattle. And uh, we checked out the Burlington one uh, the first first weekend they were open, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah, and the um, place was packed. It's been packed uh, every day, and uh, have a huge beer selection, 20-some 20, 20, 20 taps, 24 taps. 24, I think, yeah. 24 taps, and uh, some pretty good food, too. Yeah, very good food, and the prices, I mean, we went on Sunday, and they have a happy hour deals all day long, and uh, the prices were good, and the food was great. Yep, and it's a family-friendly place. Uh, no problem bringing your kids there. They Did they have a kid's menu, too? I think they yes, did. Yes, they did. Had a kid's menu. So uh, all those things. Uh, Very friendly, too. Yes, yes. Ex- ex- our waitress was extremely friendly. Uh, checked back multiple times. You know, have to go back uh, again after they've been open for a while to make sure that the service is still just as good. But, yeah, you're right. But service was really good, and uh, the, the food was good. Got some wings, and um, they were actually pretty good. Being from Buffalo, got to try the wings. Got to rate those wings. <laughs> and uh, they were actually pretty good. I didn't get regular Buffalo-style wings, though. I got... Uh, sweet chili or something. Yeah, I sweet think. chili. And those were pretty tasty. But, um, yeah, NYP. Check it out. Uh, I know there's one in Seattle, Everett, Bellingham, Burlington. So check it out. Now, I'm going to try another beer. This time we have Nine Squared from Lazy Boy Brewing, 7.2% ABV. It uh, We stopped in there during uh, Seattle Bear Beer Week for their ninth anniversary celebration. Yep. And uh, we got some of this in a growler. And um, this, uh, this is a definite uh, IPA. <laughs> very, very uh, citrusy and very bitter and very good. The so Lazy Boy Brewing Company was established in March 2006 in Everett, Washington. As a small craft production microbrewery, they are now offering their craft products in the greater Pacific Northwest, including Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. Their craft products can be found at Safeco Field, on Argosy Cruises, at local grocery stores, bars, restaurants, and at their brewery tap room. Grocery stores? They must be bottling. They are bottling. Oh, I miss that. Oh, this stuff is good, though. It's uh, again. It's a little darker amber, and um, very bitter. It's uh, it's good though. I I I like it. I guess I, I belong here. <laughs> you definitely do. Nine Squared is one of the three special IPAs that Lazy Boy brewed for their ninth anniversary. Nine Squared is the second of the three beers and is a seven point two percent ABV hopped with Citra and lemon drop. 
Yeah, that's good. All right, and that brings us to the end of this episode of Northwest Brew Talk. Make sure that you tune in next week when we chat with Republic Brewing. The show is produced and edited by me with engineering help, help from Michelle Rizzo. If you want to contact us, you can also email us at nwbrewtalk at gmail.com or you can give us a call at 541-595-TALK. That's 541-595-8255. And until next time, I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. Stay hopping, my friends.